I'm Nicole Kasperson, fintech journalist, and this is What the Fintech. As a journalist who has covered the finance sector over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to interview and engage with some of the best minds in the space. The media landscape is changing, and financial services is grabbing the attention of a more diversified audience than ever before. As a member of that growing demographic, I will provide direct access to the inner workings of a complex industry while bringing in an unconventional perspective to news coverage. Leaving big bank earning reports to the boring traditional media firms, I'll focus on the tech-savvy apps, digital investing platforms, challenger banks, and payment giants to drive relevant content that looks forward to disruption instead of fearing it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to What the Fintech, the podcast for fintech professionals who are ready to shape the future of our industry with innovation and inclusion. I'm your host, Nicole Kasperson, and today I'm interviewing Kelly Fryer. She's the executive director at Fintech Sandbox, a nonprofit that enables early stage fintech founders to build impactful products by giving free access to essential data. Prior to Sandbox, Kelly was the director of Techstars Fintech Accelerator Program, the Barclays Accelerator, powered by Techstars New York. She also spent several years on Bloomberg's global data team, managing relationships with financial data providers and banks. In this episode, Kelly and I talk about her passion for film production and how that's led her to the fintech space. We also discuss representation in the industry and how data access for founders leads to more equitable fintech and the fintech ripple effect, and how Kelly manages her career and life by getting outside. I'm so excited to share my conversation with Kelly Fryer. Welcome, Kelly, to What the Fintech. Thank you. I'm so excited for to be here. I feel like we've been talking about this for so long, and I, I'm excited that um, we're finally able to sit down and chat. I know, I know. It is about time. So to start, I would like to ask you, how are you doing this morning, and where are you working from? Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, I love mornings. I've been up for, uh, it's 9 a.m. right now. I've been up since at least 5. So I, I love mornings. It's the quiet time where I'm able to like be productive in the day and before everybody else has woken up. Um, so love it. And uh, I'm calling from just outside of New York. I'm based over in Jersey City. Um, and I've been here for the last, gosh, five or so years now. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, so that's awesome. So I'm really trying to become a bit more of a morning person. I always have been, but I want to get it like I love that five, that like five to six a.m. realm. I'm currently in like a six to seven a.m. realm. So if I could just like increase it, yeah, like an hour because I agree, it's like the time of day where you know, no, like my Slack is quiet. Exactly. (laughs) It's the hardest part about the morning is going to bed early enough to get up early enough. (laughs) Got it. Yes. It's like, I got to like, let me try to get to sleep before like midnight. And then maybe I can start to think about like a five to 6am. Exactly. Oh man. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well also besides like prying into what you do in the mornings, I also want to dive into, um, really your original career passion. I love that we talked about this on our, um, prep call because in college you said you wanted to be a film producer and I'm just jazzed to try to like translate that into your role today <laughs> with the Tech Sandbox. So do you see a correlation between that original desire to share stories uh, with the role that you have today working with fintech founders? A loaded question for a 9 a.m. sunrise pod. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, and it's such a funny career trajectory. I'm not fully sure how I ended up here, but I feel like that's kind of the nature of careers. Um, but yes, I started off um, going to school wanting to be a film producer, looked solely at kind of film and um, movie schools. Um, and, you know, now looking back, I think some of the connective tissue um, was less about kind of wanting to share stories and maybe more about wanting to help people make their dreams come to life. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even when I was a small kid, I mean, I was still like drawing up like business plans and like restaurant like layouts and things like that. I think, you know, it's very similar, like movies, companies, they both just kind of start as crazy ideas in someone's head. And then... Um, you know, you need kind of a whole village of people and also a lot of money <laughs> generally to make it a reality. And so I think I liked the idea of just being that 
person that can help um, make a dream kind of come to fruition. And I think that's probably the thread in between those two. That is really cool. I feel like when I was a kid, I was maybe just like drawing pictures of who knows squiggles. I'm not sure what I was doing. I that too. <laughs> <laughs> squiggles were like somehow then they like translated into like a business plan. That's actually really, what? That is really cool. Like no, I, I had like a very um looking back now, thank God for my parents. I mean, they just let me experiment with like so many odds and ends and craziness. But I mean, it was very, I would say like real world hands-on play. So like even, you know, my phase where I wanted to be a chef, my parents mm-hmm. were letting me take like every random ingredient in the kitchen and throw it into a stock pot and call that a soup. And oh. then they'd pretend to eat it and things like that. So very, um, I think very imagination based play um, and thinking when it came when I was a little kid. And so, um, like I said, experimented with a lot of different things. And my parents um, gave me a long, long lead to do so. So, so thank God for them. Yeah. Okay. Kudos to kudos to parents uh, for for letting you know your creative juices flow, and um, you know maybe that like right that kind of creativity and being almost like multifaceted in what you know you could apply right your your skill set to like wanting to help build something, wanting to help someone, um, kind of like follow whatever that dream is, and that you feel that you know success from someone else's success. I mean, I imagine that, you know, you, maybe you, that's something you must've felt when you kind of didn't intentionally get into FinTech, which most of us really don't. <laughs> um, I know I didn't intentionally get into FinTech. I had no idea what it was when I was right. <laughs> who, what, what's that? It's FinTech. But anyway, so, um, yeah, I mean, for you, is that why, you know, you ended up staying after you kind of had found the FinTech world and your place in it? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right about that kind of um, serendipitous nature, I think, of careers and opportunities and just kind of getting into fintech generally. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think staying in fintech, I mean, fintech, especially these days, it's just this like ever evolving thing, right? Where um, the discussions and focuses of fintech, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago are very different than they are today. You know, I think before it was much more of like traditional capital markets and trading products and like kind of the beginning of digitization. And now you're getting into, um, you know, blockchain and financial inclusion and just levels deeper than, than we were 10 years ago and starting to get into a lot more kind of alternative issues. And I think a lot more real world issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the creativity and in, in how fintech really touches everything that we do, right? Because everything we do involves some kind of interaction with money. So you get this just kind of interesting vantage point of both tech and product, but also just kind of how we're trending as a society and what we're focused on as a society. It's a little bit of like, a, um, I don't want to say a history book, but kind of it, it follows along with kind of where people are going. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge, I love that you put it that way because that is a huge reason why, you know, I wanted to stay in fintech and why I am here and uh, why it's like always still so interesting to me every single day. Cause you can, yes, you get to see like infrastructure change and, uh, and that type of thing. And that's been happening right for, for some time, but then, but now we're getting to the point where it's actually like a part of like culture conversations where it's like every day, we're talking about this where, you know, I, I can't really go anywhere, even in a social capacity without someone asking me about, you know, what I do and then learning about fintech and being like, oh my gosh, like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Yes. And like, they're so interested and they don't, they're not in finance, like they're not or tech, like they're just, they're in like, you know, agriculture, but just like want to hear mm-hmm. about this or whatever. Um, so that, that is actually like, you're right. I think there is something to almost like seeing kind of the history of like, our society evolve with uh, finance and technology pushing it into you know what we want to see as a more equitable direction. Um, that's a powerful thing, and it's like feels really cool to be kind of like on the forefront of that and a part of that. Exactly. Yeah, you're a part of that um, that wave, that trend, that movement, um, and I think that's a big reason, at least these days, why so many people are either getting into fintech or staying a part of fintech. You know, folks that have been in it for a decade plus at this point. Yes. Yes. That's at least like my hope is to like highlight those people on the show. And, you know, hopefully there's that, you know, of course we all want to like have successful businesses, but 
hopefully like the first part is the yeah. <laughs> most, yeah, so Yes, we want to use fintech to help help the world, which does bring us to, you know, fintech sandbox and helping build that more equitable right society that we we want to see. So, you know, talk to us about how fintech sandbox does help build that um, equitable fintech sector for founders. Yeah, sure. Um, so Fintech Sandbox is a nonprofit that helps early stage startups get free access to critical data and resources that they need in order to build their products. And, you know, data is really one of the most important resources for early stage fintechs. Um, but the inaccessibility of data, both in terms of like um, structural and like actual usable data, but also the pure cost of data really impedes innovation. Um, so Fintech Sandbox offers these data sets to our startup members for free through our data access residency program. Just, you know, again, if you think about um, an early stage fintech that's just trying to launch in a more economical way, how do you make entrepreneurship possible in the financial um, sector when you have such limited access to resources and your money could be used for more beneficial things like hiring or building out your product? Um, so our program really focuses on how do you help um, effectively help startups to build their product and data access in the financial space is really one one piece of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes a lot of sense that, um, you know, not especially when you're a startup founder and, you know, not everyone can afford just like mass amounts of like data access and, and that type of exactly. thing. Um, and so that's, that's really, really cool to, you know, kind of hone in on, on that specific, like that specific aspect of like a founder's journey to help them, you know, maybe like not worry so much about that and that cost and still be able to like, right. Be that creative, uh, person that, that they are. And you, you help with that. I mean, I'd be, I'm interested in like, how does FinTech Sandbox, I guess, like get, you know, the specific data that each individual founder needs. Right. Cause like you kind of have to like customize the data, to, you know, whatever that founder's kind of journey to, yeah. we hope, is. Yeah, absolutely. So we work with about 40 different data partners um, currently. So folks like um, Equifax and Plaid and TransUnion and FactSet and SMP um, and other wonderful partners. And so they're offering some of their premium data sets for free to our startups um, for six months. Um, so think of it almost as an extended free trial, but it's exclusively for our vetted startups. So, um, you know, one thing that we really focus on as we look at new data partners is that exact thing of like, what's the trend coming? What data sets are we going to need? Um, in the beginning, when Fintech Sandbox first started back in you know 2014, like I said, capital markets was a huge focus. And then with time, you know, we added in some credit data and some news data and some consumer data. And now we're starting to get more and more requests and look forward to things like Again, ESG data is obviously huge right now, or getting into like private companies data, um, compliance and KYC focused data, mobility data, um, even kind of climate, agriculture, um, some of those other kind of niche areas. So we're starting to see more and more alternative data sets, unstructured data sets, niche data sets that we're needing to get access to, to get in front of the waves that are, are coming and the requests that we're getting from startups. Yeah. Ooh, so cool. I mean, from like when it when you think about something like, you know, 2014 uh, and the data sets maybe being uh, a lot more interested or, or folks being more interested in data sets with like capital markets. And then you fast forward to like today where maybe, a, you know, ESG is something that's a little bit more popular. I mean, do you how is seeing kind of that like different trajectory? Do you think we're like heading in the right place. Like, I feel like we kind of are now, like we are kind of heading more towards like, oh, we are caring about like ESG or like yeah. diversity, like data or that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you kind of have like seen some of that like evolution, right. By just like being there to see the data that startup founders need. And it must be kind of just like, cool. Is there anything that's like the most, you know, exciting to you that like has changed when it comes to like that, different, I guess, like trajectory? Yeah. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we are, I think we're trending in the right direction. I mean, I think we're seeing more and more startups that are trying to solve for real world issues and not just, um, you know, 
uh, how to make more profits for traders or for individual businesses and that sort of thing versus actual um, problems that either small businesses or individuals are facing, um, which is really, really exciting. You know, one interesting thing that I noticed, and I anticipated that this would happen, but then it was cool to see it within the data was, you know, FinTech Sandbox has traditionally been pretty heavy on the B2B side um, before we started focusing more on kind of sustainable and inclusive finance focused um, data and companies. Um, and I anticipated that that would start to even out a little bit where we were about 70% B2B companies and 30% B2C. Um, and even just within the last year, we're starting to already see a balance where we're starting to grow closer to, you know, 40% B2B, 40% B2C, and the rest kind of a, a mix of B2C. B2C or other forms. Um, so you're seeing a lot more focus, I think, on like consumer issues or even small business issues as opposed to like big enterprise tech solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally, totally agree when it comes to just like, for me, I'm always looking at like the demographic changes, right? And then like seeing how like, how do fintechs kind of, um, and, and, you know, leaders in the space like evolve, right, with that. And that's exactly kind of what you're helping like founders when they come in or, you know, even when they're just getting off like the ground running. Um, but that is exciting. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that, um, you know, just, you kind of just like, despite all the madness of this, like the last few years, um, it is nice to see that like fintech and the space is evolving to be more like consumer facing. Cause it's almost like you had to deal with like, right. That B2B side first before and, and handling that before, like uh, having those benefits of that, the infrastructure there being in place to trickle down into like the end user and the end consumer. But that's why it's like important to focus on, you know, equity for founders or, or B2B, because then it actually, I don't do you think it makes it easier to then translate over to the, you know, B2C market when that side kind of already has some of its like innovations in place? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because if you think about, okay, let's get um, sort of the actual structural components built um, if you think about now um, with like a, a banking tech stack or, um, again, digital banking things that we're able to do now, and it's like, okay, let's get that kind of digital infrastructure side in place. So now we can focus on how is our actual user experience for consumers or what solutions do um, the consumers actually want. So I do think it is kind of a natural um, progression to start with that piece first. And then you can dive into like more specific problems or more specific um, niche areas. And, and that's kind of what you're, you're seeing now. I also think, you know, again, entrepreneurship generally is becoming more accessible. And you're seeing, especially out of COVID, you're seeing more and more entrepreneurs get into, um, sorry, more and more people get into the entrepreneurial space. Um, and through that, you're seeing people that naturally create products that they've experienced firsthand. So yeah. again, I think as you see more people get become entrepreneurs, start their own companies, then you also just naturally start seeing more consumer-based products because that's what people have experienced. You know, we have a company that's digitizing rent payments for independent landlords or building pathway to wealth or home ownership or doing, you know, inventory financing for small businesses. Like these are all problems that people have um, directly experienced and they're like, it doesn't work the way it is happening right now. We have to fix this and I'm the person to fix this. Um, so I think that's the other piece that kind of um, lends itself to the consumer side. Yeah. Oh, and it's, and it's exciting. Um, cause you know, the, we are at a place where, um, software and technology is mature enough where, you know, everyone can win. It's like kind of one of my, my taglines, um, you know, from, from the, the provider to the end user to everyone in between. Um, there, there is no reason why everyone can't get, you know, a piece of the pie and the wealth. Um, but we're kind of like talking about it a little bit, but I wanted to ask like you specifically about kind of that like fintech ripple effect overall and kind of explaining what that is. Um, we have, like I said, we kind of like are talking about it a little yeah. bit, but and just how it leads to that more sustainable and inclusive financial systems I, and other systems too, like, you know, healthcare and supply chain, you know, I think that's a piece we haven't really hit on yet is how, you know, what we do in our fintech world does, will trickle down to, to other industries. And, and that's important. Uh, you know, when we're operating day to day, but love to hear that side from you. 
Um, yeah, I, I think ripple effect is such a great way to, to think about it. I mean, I, if you think about a giant relationship map or even a giant Venn diagram or something, there's not a single industry or area of our life that fintech or financial services doesn't touch. Um, so I think naturally that lends itself to the technologies and products of fintech um, having an impact on other industries. So again, primarily because of, I think, kind of the way we interact with money, but also, um, yeah, some of the tech coming out of the the fintech space, again, from like the infrastructure standpoint, even like deep tech, if you think about AI and other kind of technologies that really started in the fintech space, and those can be applied to other industries as well. So if you um, think about fintech really becoming this big catalyst for positive outcomes and change in other industries, um, whether it be fintech and healthcare, fintech and infrastructure in terms of, you know, building up cities and how we think about that aspect, um, fintech and retail, um, fintech and transportation or automotive. Um, there are just so many different applications, really. Um, you know, I talked to a company the other day that was looking at um, essentially supply chain and trade financing, which I think is always such a great example that kind of matches up fintech and supply chain and infrastructure. Um, and, you know, really dealing with some of the recent supply chain issues that the whole world has been facing and how do you tackle some elements of that. So, um, or again, healthcare is the other space that we talk about a lot in terms of whether it be healthcare financing or even, you know, we all have some kind of wearable device, right, attached to us these days. Um, and so how do you tie kind of the wearables and data that's coming out of that into insurance incentives or create more positive healthcare and kind of wellness outcomes through a fintech perspective? Um, it all starts to get really exciting and you start to see how you can chip away at some of the world's problems by kind of bringing the, the worlds together. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because we're, we're all so connected, right? Um, and I think that's something that, you know, has made even me very excited about fintech and, and the back to like kind of the wanting to stay and wanting to, you know, help the, the, this industry continue to evolve the world. Um, but yeah, that's, that is like something that um, is crazy exciting. And, you know, even in like, when it comes to healthcare, even in like that B2B uh, side, right? Like helping just kind of like, the, the efficiencies and, and that type of thing. And, and that other side of that ripple effect, right? It's like, if, you know, uh, if businesses can, and founders can, can have that data and have that access and, you know, then it's easier on them to, to produce the, the things that they are doing and then exactly. that you can eventually lower costs and then that trickles down to the, to the end user and so forth, so on and so forth. So yeah, it's like, um, that's why kind of I, like for me and my podcast is focused on like fintech professionals and, because I do believe like we got to start kind of there, right? And, and helping that uh, that aspect out first. And then we can feel that that ripple effect. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's such a um, good perspective. Or uh, I, I heard something or read something the other day that was also talking about how, um, you know, if you think about, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, even uh, applying kind of some trading concepts to it, you know, that you could um, have folks almost invest in what they think will be the future um, drugs or um, kind of compounds that will help cure cancer or cure whatever disease it might be and use almost an investment-based strategy to decide how um, these uh, health and pharmaceutical um, concepts get funded instead of, you know, some of the ways that we're doing it right now. I think that becomes, that becomes really interesting. Right. Yeah. Huge, huge. I mean, right. I mean, I think we all have a, you know, a damn near uh, uh, or better appreciation for the healthcare system. After, right. After what we've been through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I, I love it. And sometimes that's a way for me to actually help people understand even what I do um, is if I can connect it to like other industries. Exactly. That helps people people get it. Um, yeah, I love this. OK, so. I also want to ask about um, kind of what what startups fintech sandbox is maybe focusing on right now. You know, sure. ones that maybe uh, you know excite you, and um, you know, obviously like the the data access that that those folks are are super interested in now. Yeah, yeah. So we have over two hundred and fifty startups in our portfolio to date from all over the world. Um, again, we don't take any equities or fees, and so we ask for our startups to give back to the fintech sandbox community and to one another. 
Um, so the interesting thing I think about FinTech Sandbox is we really don't have a specific theme or sector focus. It's really a little bit of like, what does the data drive in, um, which can be a whole host of things, which is really exciting. So um, we see a really vast amount of types of companies from, um, like I said, those kind of focus on like enterprise and infrastructure um, to those focused on um, personal finance, mortgages, lending. We see a good amount of ESG, especially recently, various things from like ESG scores to transparency, data collection, um, all elements of that. So we see such a wide array of companies, which is really exciting from our team's perspective. Um, but the vast majority of our startups that come in are really at the early stage of their life cycle. So think about like bootstrapped or um, even siege stage companies. Um, again, going back to kind of what we were talking about before of like, how does FinTech Sandbox make um, make equity and create representation for the startups. You know, these are companies that either have raised no money and now need access to data in order to build out their product, or those that have only raised a little bit of money and now need access to data in order to launch or do some early testing. So um, it's really exciting for us that we're able to um, support the startups in that kind of early stage of their growth um, and across, again, such a wide array of fintech. Mm hmm. Yeah, that, that is that is really cool. Because I mean, you know, you need to right? like to be able to hit all like these separate, you know, connected industries and, and that type of thing that we're, we're talking about. And just, you know, you hit hidden more of the culture when you when you can be that expansive. But, you know, over 200 um, um, startups, that's a lot. What's it like kind of when so they, they get there? Is there is it like almost like a graduation program, right? Like the six months of like free data, then they they move on or like, how is it? how is it like throughout like the process and when does someone or when does like a founder say like, kind of like, thank you so much for what, what you've helped me with. <laughs> sure. I, can now, I can now move on to, <laughs> man, I all of a sudden can afford to pay for like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's that a lot of times. Um, so um, it's interesting. I come from the accelerator world um, and FinTech Sandbox is not that traditional accelerator model. So we truly are a data access residency program. So we run on a rolling basis. You know, we very much operate under the philosophy that like, it's not like data needs are set on a timeline. Different people need right. it, access to it at different times. So we want to work with you on that. So we're onboarding startups really on a, on a rolling basis. And since we focus all over the world, it's a completely virtual program. So really not any of that kind of cohort style. Um, so startups usually will, like I said, access each data set for about six months. So in total, we usually end up working with startups for closer to like nine to 12 months in total. Um, and then, you know, as they go to raise their next round or eventually get to a point where now they're, you know, in market and, and having commercial use. Um, then they might work on, you know, a commercial data agreement um, with our data partners, um, or they might find another data source that they decide, you know, this is going to work better for us than kind of what we were testing with before. And that's okay, too. Um, so we're just excited to kind of see them um, kind of go off into the world. We have plenty of alumni that, um, you know, come back and say like, hey, I, I still need access to some other data. Are you able to help us out or at least make an introduction, which we're happy to do? Um, and that's the other piece that we like to get involved with if we can is, again, from just like a business development partnership side is we have a huge community and network at FinTech Sandbox. So trying to make those connections and introductions for our companies where we can. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge, right? And yeah, obviously like a great value proposition of FinTech Sandbox and, you know, being able to make those those partnerships to, you know, be able to say like, hey, you know, these are these are some like amazing founders to so like these data companies and you know, eventually you could have some sort of, you know, enterprise agreement or long-term commitment um, to access the data and vice versa. And um, yeah, I mean, it's always like helpful to introduce new people and and have kind of that like, because um, you never know what will happen if like a founder's like, hey, you know, I'm interested in this data and like a data provider is all of a sudden like, you know what, we haven't done that before, but maybe we should. And no, it, it happens. Absolutely. We've seen data providers that, um, you know, work with one of our startups and they're like, oh, we've never thought about having the data used in that situation or for that use case. And then they think about, you know, turning it into its own marketable, pro marketable product that way. Or, you know, a lot of our data providers like seeing what the startups are working on. Again, getting a sense of, what trends are coming down the pipeline? How should we internally be thinking about the data based off of how, you know, these early stage companies are thinking about the data? So it's pretty cool, actually, to see the um, 
kind of symbiotic relationship back and forth between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what's the moment that makes you feel like, uh, almost like when you feel that success, right? Like, uh, I think I remember you saying how like you're super fueled by, um, you know, helping someone else reach their success is success for you. And, um, man, I feel that, I feel that a lot. So, um, you know, when, what does that moment look like for you with FinTech Sandbox? Is it when the, the, the founder is off able to like go butterfly on their own or yeah. What is like, or is there an example of like that moment where you've kind of felt that, that moment of your own, you know, kind of personal success fueled by someone else's? Yeah. So I would say it comes at like a few different moments. It really depends on the company. One is like a good amount of startups that come to us are like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy we found FinTech Sandbox in the first place. Like we need help with access to data. We didn't know you existed kind of thing. So um, one, I love to hear that and that just, you know, we exist and us have um, being here for the startups has been um, beneficial to them outright. Um, two, you know, again, when they get access to a data set, now they're able to either test a feature or go live with a product or close a deal. Sometimes they're using the data to like, I need to demo something to a potential customer. Um, and so now having access to that, they're finally able to like close their first bit of revenue. That's exciting. Um, and then third is usually, you know, the funding round that eventually comes um, to go to the next next scale, whether it's their seed round or series A. Um, we have a number of companies at this point that have been acquired. So it's always exciting to see them get acquired sometimes by our data providers or um, oh. partners too, which is cool. Um, so all of those little moments, milestones are, are always, you know, prides of joy for sure. Oh, that's, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I mean, do you think kind of going back to all of the, um, like almost like trends and data, right? Like, which are obviously like completely, um, connected and, you know, whatever, whatever trends are happening, right. The data is going to follow and vice versa. Um, but is there one that you think people maybe, you know, misunderstand, uh, or like a common maybe like misconception about the fintech industry? You know, this is more like for, I think, internally within the fintech industry, honestly, is that I think there's this notion that like everyone gets it or the average person is like right alongside of us within fintech. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much lingo and so many concepts that we talk about within the fintech world. But the reality is that like, they really aren't that mainstream. Like they might be in the news, but they're really not that mainstream. You know, I think buy now, pay later might even be a great example um, of, you know, or even the word fintech itself. A lot of times when I'm talking to friends, family, I still have to explain what fintech is and what that actually means. Um, you know, someone the other day kind of asked me about the metaverse and how quickly I thought that that would be a huge fintech focus and that we'd start seeing companies in the fintech sandbox focus on the metaverse, which I definitely think it will happen. But I also think the average person walking down the street isn't thinking about how, how am I going to buy real estate in the metaverse or how am I going to bank in the metaverse? You know, they're struggling to do that in the real world or potentially aren't doing it at all in the real world today. Um, so I think there is like a little bit of this bubble kind of within the fintech industry um, that things aren't as mainstream as we believe them to be because we talk about them so much. Yeah, that is a good point. That is a good point. I, um, you know, almost like just as many times as I run into someone that's like, oh, fintech, they usually immediately ask me about crypto. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, but, that's what they think fintech is, is crypto. Or just like investing apps only, yes. right? And then um, but just as much as I get that, sometimes I have to like literally, someone's like, fintech, what's that? And I have to be like, so grab your phone. Do you have a banking app? Do yeah. you do anything that has to do with like finance or your money on your phone? They're like, yeah. I'm like, that's been tech. Um, that's a good point. You know, it's, it's hard. It's like a hard balance in our world. It feels super, super mainstream, obviously, when you talk about it every day. Um, but sometimes, you know, I, I do kind of like, I like to, with my newsletter and podcasts, I'll also like call on the industry to say like, hey, it's up to us to actually like, you know, kind of like make sure that communication is is there um, if we want like a world where there's more mass adoption of fintech products? Because I think there's like mass acceptance, and I think that's kind of like where like crypto is kind of as well, um, where people know about it enough. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're using it or that like that they understand it or that type of thing. So mass acceptance, that's a great, I'm going to use that. That's a great way to phrase it. Uh, That's exactly it. Yes. People accept and like acknowledge that concept, but like, it doesn't mean that they are out there with their Coinbase, you know, (laughs) buying tons and tons of Bitcoin right now or anything like that. So that's such a good way to put it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, um, but yeah, I mean, kind of, what do you think the next, like, uh, you know, 10, 20, I mean, we can go 30 plus years holds for holds for fintech, you know, I guess like maybe particularly and I'll, I'll narrow it down for you in terms of like representation in in the fintech space. Um, yeah, I guess from maybe even from like a, in, from that, like in, internal part, because I that's something I talk about a lot is, as well as, you know, I think that fintech can change the world if we, you know, kind of change ourselves a little bit more yeah. and, and operate at a place where, um, you know, we, we have more female leadership where, where we, that is spotlighted as well. I mean, there's plenty of female leadership, but it's not always like put on the pro- on platforms and, yeah. and talked about enough or, you know, if there were more, um, you know, uh, uh, just like women in the C-suite or people of color in the C-suite or just diff- different types of thinkers, um, because the stats right now are not great. Uh, fintech is like still largely looking a lot like traditional finance, but it's like, we don't want to be like that. So how do we kind of look within and, and evolve? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, hopefully forward progress. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, even yeah. if so, you know, I think there will be forward progress. I I think it will continue to happen slowly because it all seems to happen slowly and take a lot of time. Um, I mean, to your point, honestly, I think it comes down to the VCs and investors and partners of fintechs and hiring managers, right? Like there's no shortage of fintechs being created by women or founders of color or fintechs trying to be trying to build a more inclusive and accessible solution. Like there's so many of them out there, but they're not getting backed. They're not getting the capital that they need in order to build. Or, you know, if you think about fintech leaders for more of like a corporate standpoint, standpoint, they're not getting promoted or getting um, the interviews that they should be. And so if that's the case, you know, then they'll, those products will never see the light of day. Those leaders won't continue to rise. And so, um, yeah, I think it comes on the decision makers to actually um, fund those companies and promote those people in order for it to happen. I, I think it can absolutely, um, but there is a responsibility um, from the top in order to help make that a reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I mean, if there was just like different kinds of people in the rooms making things happen, right, then we would maybe see more like product offerings and, and those type of things that actually, you know, cater to the to the increasingly like diverse demographic that, that we're seeing and that, exactly. you know, it's like meant to meant to reach, right? Like over the last few years, the, you know, worlds of like wealth management, financial services and, and that type of thing. I mean, they were already kind of getting that like, you know, smack in the face to like not be so catered only to the ultra wealthy. And, yeah. you know, then the pandemic kind of fueled that. So like extra uh, and accelerated that. So, um, yeah, I that's I, I agree. I'm hopeful that, you know, we will see more of that. And as we kind of move forward and that, you know, like the the global uh, figure of like female CEOs is like in fintech or, or like, it's like, it's like 12 percent. Um, hopefully that, that does increase. And, and I know we're all like working towards it. So maybe yeah. something it's like it's top of mind for me every day. But it's also like just so happens to be Women's History Month. So I'm also thinking. Yeah. About it. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that's it needs to be top of mind for for more people all the time, right? Um, there, or you know, you asked before about kind of a misunderstanding in fintech. I think this is kind of another key piece is that there's kind of this myth, especially on the B two C side, that like you can't be venture backable business if you're focused on like the financially underserved or oh you know certain populations, which is obviously ridiculous. You have great companies like. Pedal and Mochafy and Propel and others that are doing some like just incredible work in this space and built some really incredible products and solutions. Um, but like if again, if we're not packing these companies, then they'll, we won't see more of them. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's what makes like, yeah, I, it makes it exciting when there's like more like women led VCs. And so I know recently uh, Serena Williams and her uh, Serena Ventures uh, uh, raise or have, um, I was at an extra like $111 million. Yeah, so exciting. So we know Venus is already an investor in like LOS and, and some finance apps. So, uh, all right, Serena, come on, come on, girl. Right. <laughs> come join the fun in fintech. Um, but anyways, so <laughs> amazing. Well, I want to ask a little bit more also just like about you before I, I close out and have you uh, share a little bit more about like what you're excited about with fintech sandbox coming up. But, you know, for you, what are maybe some of your like personal kind of like ambitions whether with fintech sandbox without it, um, yeah, and, and that type of thing, and um, just kind of as like a leader in the space, is there anything in particular that you're just like that is like that is the the goal that is where I'm heading towards, and I am excited to get there. Yeah, that's such a tough one for me to answer, honestly. Not that I don't have ambitions, of course I do, but I, you know, I very much think that like kind of career paths are a lot about timing and kind of being in the right place at the right time. Um, so sometimes it's challenging for me to like imagine 10 years down the road or certain things like that. You know, for me, this role in FinTech Sandbox um, definitely checked off a big box for me, which was I wanted to run something. I wanted to be at the helm of something. Um, so this checked off a, a big box here. You know, honestly, it sounds simple, but like continuing to support entrepreneurs, um, enjoying my work, enjoying how I'm spending my time. I think, um, I don't know if it's COVID or just as I continue to, to get older that, it, you know, thinking of my life much more as like a whole person and not purely just the career side of things, but like as a whole, how is Kelly happy? Is Kelly enjoying how she's spending her day kind of thing? Um, you know, it's something that I focus more and more on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel that too. I, and I don't know if it's because of, I think it's like a mix of COVID and like, you know, getting older and, and maturing and growth, personal growth. <laughs> yeah. I, like, it's like, um, connecting all of the, all of the things like, you know, making sure kind of like my, my home, my home is in order and that, you know, everything is taken care of there and that like my relationships are good so that like, I am the best person I can be at at my work and, you know, cause what, especially, you know, folks, folks like us and all the folks that I have on my podcast and I hope listen to my podcast or we're all, you know, we're also mission driven yeah. and, and we all want to help change the world in our, in our own unique ways. And, but that does take a lot of output, right? Like you're kind of, you are constantly giving, giving yourself. Um, and even though you feel like amazing about it, there's still, you know, you still have to kind of like find ways to stay balanced and keep your own mental health in check. And I don't know if there's any, I always like to ask my guests how they kind of balance that. Cause I know being a leader in this space is, is, is hard, you know, it comes with its, its ups and downs and just like anything. So not sure if you have any secret sauces to how you keep your mental health. <laughs> Uh, I definitely know secret sauce. And um, I mean, it doesn't feel like I have it in balance all the time by any means. Um, you know, I think mental health is very much of like a journey. Things work for me for a little while and then like something new pops up and throws things off balance. And then I have to readjust everything and try out kind of a new strategy or a new methodology kind of thing. Um, you know, recently I've really found the more outdoor time I can get, the better. Like even this morning doing work, I had my windows open, whether it's going for a walk, spending time in the park, like literally just standing outside my front door for a few minutes, like something about that fresh air just very much settles me and puts me, I think, back in the present. Um, so that's one very small thing, but it seems to, to make a huge difference for me recently. Yeah, no, I love that. I um, especially now that the like weather's getting a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, like when when this when this podcast airs, hopefully it doesn't air on like a <laughs> on like a wintry Rainy day. day. Yeah, <laughs> when the <It's> April <laughs> snows, <laughs> then it snows. You never know. But yes, I mean, same, right? Like after this, I'm I'm thinking like, oh man, I've had like a whole I've had like a whole morning where I worked a little and like we you know prep for this and now we've done this and then you know taking before yeah you know, I've like thirty minutes until my next thing. Do I, you know, just taking that time to go walk in, walk in the park real quick. And exactly. it can be hard for me. I've had a hard time in the past, like disconnecting, like, oh, but I could be doing more work, which is a terrible way to think. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's very much of like, there's always more to do no matter mm -hmm. what, there's always more to do. So it's, uh, it's so funny. My, um, 
partner at the end of the day, he's always like, are, are you done? And I always say, I'm stopping. <laughs> I'm not done. I'm stopping here. <laughs> Because there's always more to be more to do. And yeah, I think to your point, you have to kind of create those boundaries or moments throughout your day that you can like disconnect, leave your phone, you know, in the other room and just focus on on you for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Well, amazing. Thank you so much, Kelly, for joining the show. I want to ask you my my final question. Some final thoughts here. Kelly, will you please tell us what the F we can expect from you and from FinTech Sandbox next? Yeah, we're really excited. We have our eighth edition of our demo day coming up on April 21st. Um, So it'll be from 11 to 12.30 p.m. Eastern. It'll be virtually. So we wanted investors and innovation leads and other startups to be able to tune in from all over the world. Um, So I'll give you the link for that so you can share it. Um, And then this fall, we also have our Boston FinTech Week coming up again. So that'll be September 27th to 29th, back in person in Boston, which we're so excited about. Um, Last year, we had incredible speakers like Abby Johnson and Sally Krawcheck and Silvio McCallie from Algorand. Um, so we, those are kind of our two signature events that we host every year. And we're excited to have both of them back, back in 2022. Ooh, okay. That is so exciting. Wait a minute. I need to <laughs> rent, rent a car and head to Boston. Apparently, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I want to go with that. Those are some amazing past speakers that you've had. And um, yeah, those are, those are some women I've like, admired myself. So, all right, kudos to you guys. I'm bringing in the, they bringing in the powerhouses. All right. Well, we'll link to those. Definitely send those to me so I can I can throw those in the in the show notes so that everyone can know about these amazing things. So much going on, so much uh, back to in person uh, conferences. Uh, literally, fintech week in New York City is the week of my birthday here in April, and I'm think that I'm trying to decide if I uh, I think I like that. It's like. <laughs> Naturally, would I spend my like my birth like the well? I don't celebrate my birthday for a week, but you know what I mean. But I like <laughs> it's a, it'll be a nice like fintech fintech party, fintech birthday fintech party. party. We'll make sure to to celebrate. <laughs> exactly, a little fintech birthday party, a little speaking engagements here and there. It'll be fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly, for joining me. That is a wrap on this episode. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you love this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can find me on all your favorite podcast platforms. Until next time, talk to you all soon.